Hey there, nerds, it's me, Dr. Jordan Breeding. And some say that my name is awkward because breeding implies sex is a thing, but I say that I've successfully bred two whole humans. So maybe I'm just well-named because of my prowess? Whatever. You're watching another episode of Your Brain on Crack, the only show on crack that's so cringe. Oh my God. And the only show on the internet that, hey, speaking of awkward, why don't you just pull your pants down? I'd like to diagnose. Lots of movie plots only make sense by way of careful omission of details. The slasher movie villain abruptly shows up in another city without showing a 20 minute scene of him fumbling with his knife fingers for the taxi fare. Give it a little thought though and you realize that some hilariously stupid things must have occurred in so many notable films. All off screen, for example. In Batman Begins, there was a scene during Bruce Wayne's birthday party in which a random guest pulls him aside and declares, Bruce, there's somebody here that you simply must meet. Now, am I pronouncing this right? Mr. Ra's al Ghul, or was it Mr. John Cena? <laughs> anyway, party bro Batman turns around and it isn't Ra's al Ghul or John Cena. It's this random henchman. Side note, really, this is the most intimidating stand-in that a group of ninja death assassins could find. But the real Ra's al Ghul then reveals himself standing across from the henchman. He was four feet away the whole time. Oh, his methods, supernatural. <gasps> Except, uh, hold on, wait. What happened prior to this moment? Ra's al Ghul's terrifying dead-eyed henchman introduced himself to this random woman, small talked her, and then made such a charismatic impression that she couldn't wait to introduce him to Bruce Wayne? What the hell conversation could they have possibly had? Oh, you're in textiles? Did you know each member of the League of Shadows sews his own ninja costume? That's the ancient murder team I work for. I'm the nunchuck room shift I mean, I'm the CEO, I'm in charge. So what's your deal? You know what the Tibetan mustache right is? The whole situation is absurd. Why claim to be Roz? Why talk to her at all? And what would have happened if that woman didn't immediately introduce the guy to Bruce? Would they have just kept chatting about the hors d'oeuvres? What if Roz had needed to pee? Sorry, I need to use the restroom. Oh, what do you mean, Wayne already left That's enough. That's enough. And what if Bruce Wayne had remembered to pretend that he wasn't Batman, you know, and said, uh, Good to meet you, Ruse uh, Al Goofy. That's a name of. <laughs> we'll forget. See you around, Kaj Goo Goo. Stop smiling. It's not a joke. Please leave. And then when the real Roz reveals himself, it raises even more questions. Did Roz and the henchmen huddle up and plan this meek little pointless charade for no reason but to add a bit of drama to what was already a dramatic event? Or cheap parlor tricks to conceal your true identity. How long were they lingering at the party? Was this lady the first person they tried it on or did everyone at the party get a turn to meet the fun and charming fake Roz al Ghul? How many people did this guy introduce himself to while his boss was behind them giggling? And was plan B having Roz leap out of a cake? <laughs> Furthermore, why does the woman leave? She introduces who she thinks is the most interesting man alive, and then Bruce says that he watched this man die, and then another man pops out and starts saying other crazy things, and she just walks away. In fact, it sort of looks like she leaves with the henchmen. Maybe they're heading somewhere to ride that Tibetan mustache after all. <laughs> Amusing, but pointless. Speaking of Christopher Nolan's Batman films, did you know that Batman Begins got a sequel? You may not have realized it because Batman isn't even in the title. But anyway, in The Dark Knight, Christopher Nolan got way better with his silly prank scenes. Like the one time that the Joker made a pencil disappear into a man's brain. Ta -da! But the movie's funniest scene occurs when Two-Face realizes that his sexy female nurse is in fact a sexy male nurse. But you know, with a lot of crazy sloppy makeup. Hi. The Joker then strides out of the hospital and flips a switch several times, causing the entire structure to explode and collapse. It's a great sequence. But what makes it even funnier is when you picture how long Joker must have been in that hospital pretending to be a nurse. I mean, how many explosions went off? 15? 20? The Joker must have been in there for hours. He was wiring up bombs for his entire nursing shift and probably had to take a break for lunch with the other orderlies. Did no one think to ask this husky new girl in clown paint why she was carrying a box of dynamite around to every single room in the hospital? I'm an agent of chaos. All right. 
Well, see you later. He seemingly did this during an evacuation when everybody was on the lookout for Joker doing bad shit. And how did he deal with any of that? Is there a pile of dead bodies made up of the people who asked what he was doing? You know, I just do things. I would love to see the 90 minute horror comedy where Joker plants bombs while also performing the duties of a cross-dressing clown nurse like the gritty Mrs. Doubtfire reboot we never knew we needed. Hello! Ah! You could argue that he brought along other henchmen to do the bomb planting while he himself focused on dope ass villain reveals, but Joker's whole thing is that all of his goons wear clown makeup or masks at all times too. So now you're looking at 20 clowns wandering all over the hospital with explosives, pretending they're just there to visit the sick kids or something. That's still pretty funny. Well, except for the sick kids. And how their hospital just exploded. <laughs> Speaking of children, one of the big reveals at the end of Harry Potter's fourth adventure, The Goblet of Fire, is that beloved Defense Against the Dark Arts professor, Mad-Eye Moody, isn't who he appears. In fact, he's a Death Eater named Barty Crouch Jr. working for Lord Voldemort. Voldemort. <laughs> he's working for he who must not be named by impersonating Moody. In a backstory that sounds like it was stolen from an AA meeting, Crouch maintained his facade by constantly swigging a magic potion out of a flask. Already you can imagine that conversation. My lord, is it wise to hinge our entire plot on finding someone with a rare quirk like, say, a constant fear that drinks are about to be poisoned that will then allow Barty to drink the potion from a personal flask every hour unnoticed and also nobody think that he's an alcoholic asshole? Of course it is. Pull your head out of your ass. You won because I made it so clear. Seems like a good enough explanation though, right? I mean, magic potion. <laughs> but it's significantly more difficult than it sounds because for starters, Crouch was drinking polyjuice potion. And in the movies, the Harry Potter rules are very clear. Polyjuice potion only changes your appearance. It doesn't give you the target's voice or mannerisms or anything else. Remember when Harry and Ron turned into Goyle and Crab with the potion? They still sound like themselves. Bloody hell. And when Hermione assumed the guise of an older woman, she stumbled trying to adjust to her new high heels and her huge heaving breasts. Just realized I might be confusing two different Films. There come goblins, Harry. But anyway, that means we absolutely missed the strangest part of the story. The part in which Barty Crouch Jr. A, had to train to method act as a total stranger in the eventual presence of literal experts, and B, he completely freaking nails it. Remember, he has to pull this off for an entire school year without dropping the act for even one second. And he's great at it. The kids love him, mainly because he's a walking anarchist cookbook. Correct, correct, come, come. He teaches them forbidden curses and all the good shit. He is the greatest defense against the dark arts teacher the school has ever seen, which admittedly isn't the highest bar since most of them get fired or turn into werewolves or die. Still, Crouch's ability to evade detection for an entire school year in a place filled with people trying to spot magical trickery is incredible. Did Crouch spend hours with a tape recorder perfecting his cranky Mad-Eye Moody voice? Is he a secret lover of the theater and knew that this was the role of a lifetime? How did he sleep? Did he lock the door super extra tight at night or did he sleep in a beer hat full of potion constantly dripping into his open mouth? I believe in a practical approach. It's such a Hail Mary to throw an evil wizard into an undercover op and desperately hope that he's both Daniel Day-Lewis and Kindergarten Cop. And speaking of Daniel Day-Lewis as Kindergarten Cop, if you write that script, I personally guarantee that Day-Lewis will unretire. You're welcome, Hollywood. No, you're welcome, world. <laughs> so many films in the Purgerverse, they've literally stopped doing the thing they're named after. Until the most recent film, each movie focused on The Purge, a single night of the year when all crime is legal, so society may purge itself of excess rage, thus keeping people from murdering each other on the other days of the year? Don't try to question it. <laughs> then The Forever Purge came out where all crime is legal all the time, and that's just societal collapse, man. We don't watch Mad Max Fury Road and go, wow, isn't it wild that they're just letting people jump on movie cars and play electric guitars that shoot fire? Why aren't they following the rules of the road? Why aren't they following the rules of the road? Stupid, but anyway, prior to that dumb movie, Purge Night was an exciting setting for a mayhem-filled horror fest. But wouldn't the more interesting movie be about what happens the day after? Yes, 
Yes. Remember, the purge is all about escaping legal consequences, but it can't save you from the social backlash. You still have to spend the other 364 days living and working with people who've revealed themselves to be secret psychopaths. What happens when you go back to the office and see your shy receptionist, Kathy, who had the night before gutted seven old people just to feel alive? Hey, you old f do you just like go on with the project meeting as if she's not wearing a necklace made of their ears and penises? It seems like her actions would instantly get used against her by even the most mild of office adversaries. That's a great suggestion for the company picnic venue, Kathy. Now maybe we hear from someone who didn't damn butcher seven people last weekend. But before that, this is a reminder that it's everyone's responsibility to keep the break room clean, even if they've slaughtered seven local grandparents in front of their families. Kathy. What about all the almost kills or partial kills? Would anyone really feel comfortable saying good morning to someone whose legs they chopped off the night before or who barely escaped their purge night machine gun rampage? It's we're only talking about the murder part. What happens to all the sex offenders the day after? Yeah, Graham, we know that by purge law, the things you did yesterday were legal, but I'm afraid the kids aren't super pumped about learning math from a man who put their parents in cages while he put on lipstick, and well, Graham, you're fired. Actually, are you even allowed to fire people for things they did during the purge? If not, is there an ACLU equivalent organization that's fighting wrongful purge-related terminations? Although now that I think about it, I guess anyone worried about wrongful termination could simply wait 364 days and fire problematic employees on purge night. But wait, what does that mean for protected groups? Could a racist boss fire all the minorities during the purge? Could they rewrite the company's HR policies to allow, you know, touching butts? Could they take all the pensions and burn the place down? <laughs> also, the real estate market would go freaking nuts. You sure as hell would not want to keep living next to the neighbors who tried to burn you alive. Also, wouldn't your life insurance policy have about a million complicated clauses concerning where the money goes in case your wife purges you? It just goes on and on and on. Please just let us purge. All right, so boosted the SEO for my Tibetan fetish film series, Tibet Most Stiff, <gasps> convinced Daniel Day-Lewis to bust out a slurping straw one last time, and uh, finally called Kathy out for her horrific crimes against humanity. Until next time, pull your pants up, freaking weirdo. It's been like 15 minutes.